the German experience, the seventh and uh, last video release for tonight um, on German American experience by Don Hegret Heinrich Tolzman. So we're talking about the families and the social activities and lifestyles of the Germans versus the uh, the Anglo Americans. So. In terms of work and business life, German Americans tended to view work as the basis for economic support for the family rather than as a means to obtain individual financial wealth. German Americans were noted for their thriftiness and tended to save their earnings rather than use it for speculative investment, which they considered reckless. They took pride in their work and believed in doing a job right and carefully. Work's value was in this rather than in the salary attached to a particular job. They did not approve of speculative business practices and condemned what they viewed as almost an admiration for shady business deals. They did not believe in credit and preferred to pay in cash, if at all possible, but held that credit responsibilities when made should be honored. In terms of politics, the German Americans felt that the candidate and the platform of the party, party were very important, more so than merely the party, and they disapproved of what they viewed as a tendency to vote according to a particular party. So this is on page two, 234. It also appeared to them that there was a great deal of corruption in government, that they demanded clean and honest government. Many politicians, it seemed to them, were in politics for personal financial gain rather than for public service. Also, German Americans felt that government's main objective should be to guarantee and protect personal liberty. They asked for nothing more and nothing less than this. Law and order should be maintained, but government should not intrude into the life of the individual. This meant, for example, that any attempt to legislate or control morality, what a person should eat, drink, eat or drink would be regarded as an invasion of personal liberty. So the prohibition movement, they would have been against. Germans were against the prohibition movement. German Americans placed a high value on their cultural heritage. Authors such as Goethe and Schiller and others were in their view on an equal footing with English authors and should be equally stressed as they felt English literature was overemphasized. Church groups maintained their own school system and did not place much stock in public education. Secular Germans, however, did support public institutions, but felt that they should offer German instruction as well as physical education. Often it seemed that realizing such ideas required a struggle since nativist would be in opposition. However, German Americans maintained that they paid taxes and that they insisted on their rights. In the area of leisure, German Americans noted that Anglos had a different way of spending their free time. German Americans felt that non-Germans devoted their leisure time to reform, uh, social reform crusade efforts which aimed at defining and legislative community values in terms of their lifestyle and resulted in an invasion of Ger German American personal liberty. Why did he spend these people spend their leisure time trying to reform society and legislate how others could spend their free time. For example, German Americans oppose laws against alcohol consumption and Sabbath breaking. From their perspective, such laws reflected the Puritan Sunday. German Americans preferred a continental Sunday where they could spend an afternoon with the entire family at picnics and festivities. Sunday was the one day of the week they could enjoy a glass of wine or beer with friends and family, perhaps in a local park or in a neighborhood beer garden. American, Americanization. By the late 19th century, German Americans had begun to redefine American society to incorporate their notions and concepts of diversity and cultural pluralism, for they rejected the idea of the melting pot as unfeasible and unrealistic. German Americans maintained that there were patterns of life other than those of the dominant Anglo-Saxon majority and that each ethnic group had its own vision of happiness. They argued that they could be Americans and still have a unique ethnic identity as citizenship and ethnicity are two separate entities. Being an American related to one's citizenship in the United States and the other half of the equation pertained to one's ethnic heritage. German American leaders also communicated the message of cultural synthesis, synthesizing the best of the German heritage with the best elements found in the New World. It also implied not only learning but also mastering English and becoming fully involved in American society. So cultural synthesis or cultural regeneration or is what the German Americans were known for. German Americans were hence creating and defining what it means to be an American, defining it in terms of what became known as cultural pluralism. They saw and respected cultural diversity and viewed this as completely compatible with U.S. citizenship. Catherine Niels Cozen written that the German Americans had invented an ethnicity for themselves and in attempting to win acceptance for the legitimate role of such a group identity and had helped also to create ethnicity itself 
as a category within American society. This invention was something they sought as a means to explain and justify the validity of being and remaining German-American. To distance themselves from the implications of the melting pot, they groped their way towards justifications for the perpetuation of ethnic differences. Some took the complete step to a principled defense of permanent ethnic diversity. German Americans were the forerunners for the now prevalent view that America is a society consisting of various ethnic and racial groups, each contributing unique aspects to the American culture. An ethnic group is defined as an element of the population that is related by common ties of origin and culture. It is a shared history and a shared sense of peoplehood. Ethnicity relates to ancestral origins, something inherited and shared. German Americans clearly saw themselves in these terms. They were now a major element in the population. And regardless of their diversity, shared ties of origin and historical background. Americanization meant full involvement in an English-speaking society as an American citizen, as well as preservation of German heritage. So Americanization meant to maintain your German heritage, but also be uh, 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 your full involvement as an English, in an English-speaking society as an American citizen. As American citizens, we must become Americanized. This is Carl Schurz. I said Christian Schurz before, but Carl Schurz um, and Margaret shirts um, you know, founded kindergarten. As American citizens, we must be Americanized. This is absolutely necessary. I have always been in favor of a sensible Americanization, but this need not mean a complete abandonment of all that is German. It means that we should adopt the best traits of American character and join them to the best traits of the German character. Politics, page 237. Some 48 or newspapers in 1863 proposed a special convention to voice their discontent with what they felt was the conservative manner in which the Civil War was being conducted. The meeting was held in Cleveland and proposed the unconditional surrender of the South, uh, a radical program of reconstruction, and the complete equality of blacks. So the uh, Germans were radicals. Some urged support for Fremont to replace Lincoln as the Republican candidate. Their, their support for Fremont grew in 1864, and he actually obtained the support of some German-American newspapers, but their influence was limited as they were considered radical publications. In 1864, delegates met in Cleveland and nominated Fremont, and they called for a constitutional amendment against slavery, the confiscation and redistribution of pop property, and for other kinds of social and political reforms. Since the Fremonters were viewed as radicals, the German-American press overwhelmingly supported Lincoln for re-election. The radicals were ridiculed, especially as they favored the formation of a separate German-American political party. Many even pointed out that this would divide the Republican vote and ensure a Democratic victory. However, when Fremont withdrew, the radicals threw their support behind Lincoln. So in the end, support for Lincoln was almost unanimous. Um, so... So the Germans were vital for the election of Lincoln. Something interesting I saw in the back here, appendix, German name, place names in the United States. I was, um, I was born in Covington at St. Elizabeth South. I lived in Boone County for a year, and then as a baby, a one-year-old baby, I lived in Gent, uh, Kentucky, which is on the border of Carroll and Gallatin County. So Gallatin County is where I went to school, uh, and I spent most of my childhood. So Kentucky um, that has a list of names, uh, German names in Kentucky, and Gallatin is a German name. I guess Albert Gallatin is a German, and Albert Gallatin had a lot of things, a lot of qualities actually um, that made him pretty, pretty famous and popular. He was a, a banker and a legislator, and, and did a bunch of uh, I don't know financial stuff. Um, he was an aristocrat, so he was part of the owner class, but he contributed a lot in Kentucky. The uh, German place names, you got Bernstant, you got Bradenburg, Bremen, Butchel, Custer, Frankfurt, Gallatin, Germantown, Heidelberg, Luther, Molenberg, Salem, Steubenville, and Switzer. So those are some place names uh, in Kentucky for the German Americans. Agriculture. Ask a German-American farmer about the importance of agriculture, and he will no doubt respond that farmers of German descent are the backbone of the nation. The value of German-American farmers was recognized early in American history. Dr. Benjamin Rush, an eminent American physician and co-signer of the Declaration of Independence, wrote an essay on the manners and customs of the Pennsylvania Germans in 1789, in which he illuminates the particular contributions of the German-American farmer. 
Rust concluded that German American farmers were experts in their occupation, that they were industrious and economical, that they knew good land when they saw it and maintained possession of it in um, uh, in their family after they had obtained it, that they rotated crops, they took good care of their stock, that their neat farm sheds were immediately recognizable, and that, most important, they were noted for their hard work. Dr. Rush emphasizes the importance of their success to the economic foundations of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which made possible the operation of the Bank of North America, the original financial backbone of the nation. There are some unique characteristics of the German-American farm families that distinguish them from non-German farming families. Non-German farmer, uh, American farmers have been motivated more by the idea of becoming financially secure, while German American farmers historically <coughs> been more interested in attaining success with the framework of close-knit farming communities. Also, German American farmers were more interested in residing within such a community, whereas non-German Farmers did not have this sense of community, but tended to operate and see themselves as individuals unrelated to the community at large. Moreover, German-American farmers were not particularly interested in establishing bigger farms and were less likely to go into debt. They seemed to operate with a definite ceiling in mind as, how, as to how much they want to spend and how large they want to expand their farms. For them, the main goal was to have enough land for their children and their family. On the other hand, non-German farmers were more motivated towards expansion, investment, and even larger farms as their central goal was not directed to the family and community, but just as uh, at individual profit. Also, with German-American farms, there's a tendency to turn the farm over to one's children and then live nearby, which is wild. With German-American farms, there's a tendency to turn the farm over to one's children and then li live nearby, whereas non-German farmers tend to postpone retirement and then are most likely to retire in Florida or Arizona. The end result is that land ownership is high among farmers of German stock, and there's an implicit emphasis on community and family. Indeed, in many German areas, farms have signs indicating that the farm had been in the family for one or more centuries. The German-American farmer looked for good land, preferring that which were already slightly improved. He selected land of rich forest growth, and by paying cash for it, frequently displaced even the native-born settlers from the best lands. His method of farming were thorough and patient. He would clear the land carefully of stumps and stones and aim at producing the largest possible yield per acre. He believed in rotating crops so as not to exhaust the land. He planned for the future with a view to permanent possession. The German-American farmer was not wasteful but economical. He saved even wood, which seemed so abundant, using stoves instead of huge fireplaces, constructing fences of a kind that did not squander wood. He was frugal. His diet was simple, his furniture plain but substantial, and his clothing of the best material calculated to last a long time. If his standard of living was lower than that of the native population, it was best suited to ensure success in farming. He was very considerate of his livestock, feeding his horses and cattle well and housing them instead of letting them run wild. In the winter, he kept them warm in the barns or stables. He kept them hard at work, but he never overworked them. Everything about his place was in good order, fences, houses, gardens, and agricultural implements. He first built a great barn to keep his grain. The barn was more imposing than the house, and the particular ar ar architectural style of German barns first built in Pennsylvania made its way through the Ohio Valley and can be seen in Wisconsin and wherever else German-American farmers are located. Before the days of the train, German farmers used a wagon equally inconspicuously and serviceable. The Conestoga wagon was a familiar sight from the Mohawk to the Carolinas, and in the latter days of westward progress, as its descendants, prairie schooners crossed the plains. A German farmer's house was constructed of stone for permanent occupancy, though for reasons of e economy, it generally took a second generation to build. This characteristic is noticeable in many areas where the farmer's dwellings are built of light-colored brick. The German-American farmer did most of his work with his own hands and was assisted by his wife and children. Large families were therefore a source of prosperity. Jo children were welcomed as a joy as well as an asset. Hired labor was used only in harvest time and usually consisted of nearby friends and family. German-American farmers made it a matter of pride to keep farms in their own families, generation after generation. This was true in the colonial period as well as in the present. They kept their own land and they brought, bought that of their neighbors. German-Americans, 
this is exactly the group servers. This is the, the group server family that I know and understand. They are 100% authentically German Americans.